Um, let's suppose that somehow we solve that problem that we talked about in the last hour, and we are able to find a population that we're confident in generalizing outward to. Uh, then the focus would be on inference about that number theta, the mean in the population. So looking at the diagram from last time, uh, the modeling diagram from the Frequentist point of view, um, you know theta hat came out 0.18 in the data, but add, since your sample is like a random sample, if you think about the nature of random sampling, um, it will not be true that every random sample is a perfect representation of the population. That's impossible to, to, uh, to achieve, but it will generally be true that um, in important aspects, for example, with respect to the mean, the sample should look a lot like the population. And so our job is going to be, just like in that diagram with the little population and sample clouds, we're going to reason backwards from the theta hat over here back to the theta. And so inference focuses on that particular unknown quantity there, right, that there's theta. It represents the underlying death rate for heart attack patients in the population of people who are similar to the Dominican patients. Um, and the question then becomes, uh, if that number, if we make an estimate of that number and it turns out to be shockingly high relative to how other hospitals are doing, then the Dominican hospital has some explaining to do. And they can try to explain it either based on how sick their patients are or on the fact that they don't have the best structural advantages or whatever it might be. But if they can't explain it on those things, then it's probably going to be due to bad process and then something they can fix. So that's the nature, the sort of indirect nature of the way people try to use these things to see if there are quality of care problems. Then the frequentist model for the data would say that if you knew what theta was, each of the y's would be like an independent, identically distributed draw from that very same Bernoulli distribution I showed you before. Namely, it would be the probability that y sub i would be 1 would be theta and the probability that y sub i would be 0 would be 1 minus theta. So that would be the, a shorthand for the standard frequentist model. In fact, that phrase right there, yi iid Bernoulli theta, i equals 1 to n, for some theta um, between 0 and 1, that is exactly a math way to summarize this picture right here. This picture says yi's, if we call these numbers here, y1 through yn, this is a picture, pictorial version of that statement, y1 through yn are iid Bernoulli theta. That's what the picture is trying to say. OK, so, and talking about, uh, as frequentists, we would be thinking about these things as random variables. The logical status of theta, from both the frequentist and the Bayesian points of view, is that it's a fixed unknown constant, and we're wondering about it. We don't know what it is. From the frequentist point of view, the logical status of the y sub i's is that at the moment we're thinking about them before we have observed them, they are random variables. We haven't seen them yet, and so their behavior is going to unfold randomly once we actually observe them. And so um, this statement that they're iid from the same distribution um, allows us to write down the joint sampling distribution of all of them the same way I showed you before. And because they're independent, because of the i part of things, the joint sampling distribution of all of them is equal to the product of the separate sampling distributions. So in other words, I'm able to write down the following statement that the probability that capital Y1 equals little y1, comma, which means and, y2 equals little y2, comma, which means and, dot, 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 down to capital YN equals little yn, which I could just summarize with the simple vector P of little y1 through little yn. Because of independence, that's equal to the separate probabilities of each of those things occurring. So I get to take each of those separate probabilities and multiply them. Dot, 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 down to the last one. Everybody on board for that? And so a fancy way to write that is that the joint distribution is the product of the marginal distributions. I equals 1 to n, which could also be written just P of yi in the a little bit of abbreviated notation that we've used. But look, what's the... What's the joint distribution? Uh, I mean, the marginal distribution. We already have an expression for that. That's i equals 1 to n, theta to the yi, times 1 minus theta to the 1 minus yi. 
So the joint sampling distribution can be written as the product of all the little marginal guys, and each one of them has that form. So let's multiply it out and have a look at it. It says theta to the y1, 1 minus theta to the 1 minus y1, times theta to the y2, 1 minus theta to the 1 minus y2, times dot, 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 all the way down to theta to the yn, 1 minus theta to the 1 minus yn. And that, in turn, we ought to be able to simplify, right? I can collect all the thetas together and all the 1 minus thetas together. And something cool happens. I get theta to the y1 times theta to the y2 times dot, 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 down to theta to the yn. And that's the same as theta to the sum of all the y's. So theta to the power y1 plus dot, 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 down to plus yn. And what's left over here is 1 minus theta to the sum of all those powers. And I get 1 added to itself n times. So this is n minus the sum of all the y's. So that's a way to write down the joint sampling distribution. And we can write it even more compactly. So I'll write it this way, PY1 through YN equals theta to the S times 1 minus theta to the N minus S, where S is just the sum of the YIs as I runs from 1 to N. So we've now been able to write down the joint sampling distribution in this compact mathematical form. And if you were using it probabilistically, you could use that expression to predict the behavior of all sorts of patterns of ones and zeros that you might get if you randomly sampled from this. If you knew what theta was, you could work out the probability behavior of future data sets. But Mr. Fisher, he said, well, uh, there's going to be two. I'm going to tell you now the frequentist approach to drawing inferences in this problem. And there turn out to be two parallel narratives, one from Mr. Fisher and one from someone who uh, became uh, Fisher's um, uh, hated rival, um, uh, this man called Jersey Naiman, who was the guy who invented hypothesis testing, uh, together with um, uh, Egon Pearson. Uh, all these people, if you've heard anything about the history of statistics, it's, it's all related to each other. Carl Pearson in the 1890s is the guy who invented the chi-square test and uh, the correlation coefficient. His son, Egon Pearson, worked with Jersey Naiman to develop hypothesis testing. Fisher invented likelihood inference and confidence inter uh, and name and invented confidence intervals. I mean, all, uh, all this stuff you've met before in your, in your classes, there's a small set of people who did all this work. So first I'm going to tell you the Fisher narrative, and then I'm going to tell you the Neyman narrative. The Neyman narrative connects to that little diagram I showed before, and the Fisher narrative comes directly from this expression here. Um, Fisher said to himself, well, um, OK. If I haven't seen any data yet, this expression tells me how the data might come out. But maybe I can get extra value out of this expression after the data has already arrived. So he said, I'm going to invent something, which is the following thing. This at the moment could be written if I use the uh, vector notation little y to stand for y1 through yn. This could, in notation that we'll be using in the Bayesian story, this thing right here could be written p of y given theta. And in fact, uh, Fisher would have never written that because for him, theta is not something that can be treated like a random variable. Theta is a fixed unknown constant, and it doesn't have any kind of repeated sampling narrative. It's just a fixed number. But this notation is perfectly reasonable in the Bayesian approach. And to get us ready for that, I'm going to use that notation there. Fisher says, if you knew what theta was, that's why the given theta, then you could use this formula to predict how the data might come out. But that's not that valuable, he said now that the data is already here. And yet, I should be able to use this expression to learn something about theta. And so here he's what he did. He did an Alice in Wonderland kind of sleight of hand. He said, I'm just going to think about this. At before, a minute ago, it was a function of y for fixed theta, because I was sitting around before the data arrived, imagining I knew what theta was, and asking how the data would come out. He said in one of those Alice in Wonderland things about imagining 12 impossible things before breakfast and so on, he said, I'm going to take that same function, and I'm just going to think of it instead as a function of theta for fixed y. And he called it the likelihood function. So we're going to call L of theta given y, and it's going to be equal to any positive constant multiple of the joint sampling distribution. So this thing here is called the joint sampling distribution, P-I-S-T for short. That's this thing there. And this thing here, Fisher called the likelihood function. 
Um, and C is any um, positive constant multiple you want. So what he's done is he's taken a mathematical function. This thing on the right-hand side is, is literally a function of both theta and S. And he said, well, before the data came in, you're entitled to think about it as a function of y for fixed theta. But after the data has arrived, I'm just going to take the same mathematical object and think of it as a function of theta for fixed y instead. And there's no harm in that. It's a mathematical object. It's a function of two things. I can think of it any way I want. He thought he was the first person in history to do this. Uh, and in, as I mentioned, in a refrain that will come up over and over again, he wasn't. Laplace did this ahead of him back in the 1790s. Uh, but except Laplace didn't give it a sexy name. And Fisher gave it a sexy name. He called it the likelihood function. And he was trying to claim that this will enable us to come up with some sense of which theta is the most likely to have really given rise to the data we had, even though he's not allowed to use the language of probability about theta, because for him, theta is not something that can be treated like a random variable. So he's using this slippery word likelihood. And he says, OK, let's look at that function and see if we can invent a good way to summarize that function as a way of learning about theta. So catching up with this stuff on the screens here and getting back to the right screen, the joint sampling distribution is the product of the marginals. And since they're all so identically distributed, the joint sampling distribution has that form there. I'm going to use the symbol little y to stand for the vector of observed data values. And this is Fisher's little trick. Before the data have arrived, I can think of this as a function of y for fixed theta, because it tells me how the, the data would be likely to behave in the future if I were to take an IID sample from that Bernoulli distribution. Fisher now says, OK, go ahead. And after the data arrived, take the same function, but reinterpret it as a function of theta for fixed y. And so now I forgot to put the arbitrary c right there. But any positive constant multiple of the joint sampling distribution, but interpreted as a function of theta for fixed y. And we know already that that has the form. I can take the c equal to 1. It doesn't matter what you put in there. And uh, think of the likelihood function having the form theta to the s, 1 minus theta to the 1 minus s. So here in our display on paper, we're going to think of the likelihood function for fixed y as I'll take c equal to 1 and work with theta to the s, 1 minus theta to the n minus s, where s, as before, is the sum of the y's. All right, now he has a problem. He has to do something ad hoc, because he needs now to interpret the likelihood function and look at it and figure out a way to summarize it to come up with a single number that would be your best guess for theta. So it would, be, it would be good to begin by making a graph of it. So let's try that. It's easy enough in R to make a picture of that thing. Suppose that, as I said, the, it turns out that uh, n is 400, and um, s is whatever it needs to be in order the theta hat is 0.18. I forget what that number is. I think it's 72, isn't it? Um, so suppose that's true. I can easily ask R to go ahead and plot that function. And I've done that here for us on the next page. Except you can't see it over here because I've got the wrong screen. So as theta runs from 0 to 1, the likelihood function looks like this. And I've drawn it over again, focusing on the part where it's appreciable. So I've drawn a magnifying, I've held a magnifying glass up to the part where theta runs from 0.12 to 0.24 over in the second hand part. Now, what does that right-hand picture look like to you? Looks a lot like a normal curve. But that would mean you're thinking of theta as like a random variable, wouldn't it? Because that would make that a probability density for theta. And Fisher was trying really hard not to do that. And now I want to tell you why he was trying really hard not to do that. Um, Fisher was an undergraduate at Cambridge in the uh, around 1915 or so. and um, uh, up until that point, after Laplace did his work, all the inferential work in the world was Bayesian. So the world was basically Bayesian from when Bayes first started talking about it all the way up until around 1915. Um, and Fisher, the first paper he ever pu published about this idea that we're coming to now was Bayesian. 
Then, between 1915 and 1924, he read some books by some people, including that guy John Venn, and also George Boole, the guy of Boolean logic fame, and also another guy called Cristal. And all these people um, argued vigorously that the Bayesian story was not to be relied upon, um, and the Frequentist story was the only one that created this kind of objectivity that Venn was trying for, as I said earlier, that actually is a, an illusion. And the reason was, as you saw from the use of Bayes' theorem earlier this morning, you cannot make the posterior calculations without bringing in the prior information along with the data information. Bayes' theorem says posterior equals normalizing constant times prior times likelihood. And then said, I don't like that part about the prior, because two different scientists with the same data set might bring in different prior information, and they'd get different scientific answers. And that completely threatened his idea of objectivity. But if you think about it, two scientists with different information bases external to the data set ought to have different scientific answers, even if they both work with the same data set. If you're doing optimal information processing and two people come to the table with different sets of information, they should get different answers, even if they agree on the data set. If they have different data sources, uh, information sources external to the data set, then they should get different answers. And yet, no one pointed that out in Venn's lifetime. Um, and his argument against the Bayesian story um, was allowed to stand. And Fisher was greatly influenced by this. So he tried to create a theory of inference based only on the likelihood function. So remember, the Bayes theorem says posterior equals constant times prior times likelihood. He tried to pretend that you didn't have to specify the prior. He therefore wasn't interested in talking about posteriors. He therefore wasn't talking about, interested in talking about theta as something that had a distribution connected with it as a way of expressing your uncertainty about it. For him, theta is just a fixed constant, and this is just a function of theta, which is not, in his world, supposed to be interpreted as a probability density. But it sure does look like a normal curve, doesn't it? Um, and in fact, the Bayesian interpretation of the likelihood function is exactly that. Theta can be thought of as like a random variable, and that's the likelihood information about it, that normal curve right there. Kind of interesting, you remember the math form of the normal curve, 1 over blah, 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 um, e to the minus stuff, minus stuff squared. We drew the function theta to the s times 1 minus theta to the n minus s. That doesn't mathematically look anything like the normal curve, and yet it turns out to look exactly like the normal curve. There are many mathematical functions, especially as n, the dimension of the data set, grows. There are many mathematical functions that converge to the normal form because of the central limit theorem that you've heard about. Um, in your earlier math classes. All right, so this looks a lot like a Gaussian distribution, uh, not yet density normalized, of course, for theta, which is the Bayesian way to interpret the likelihood function. We'll be getting to that a bit later. Um, there's something else funny about this picture. Uh, I draw your attention to the vertical axis. What sort of numbers are we working with? Really, really, really tiny numbers. The biggest number there is 10 to the minus 82. That's because we took 400 probabilities and multiplied them together. There's 400 numbers between 0 and 1. No wonder the product is really small, right? Um, that encourages numerical instability, right? We've got really small numbers here. And if I had tried to do this picture in R with n equals 4,000 instead of 400, it would have failed because we would have been working with numbers like 10 to the minus 800 or 10 to the minus 1,000, and R does not have enough precision, even in 64-bit machines, to be able to do that. So what's the obvious thing when working with the likelihood function? What's the obvious thing to do to it to remove numerical instability? Take its log, right? Because the logarithm function is the thing that converts products into sums, and sums do not have this problem of underflow. And so uh, even more fundamental in both Fisher's theory and uh, the Bayesian theory in some sense, even more fundamental than the likelihood function is the logarithm of the likelihood function, otherwise just known as the log likelihood function. And that has a simple form here. It's just s times log, s times log theta plus n minus s times log 1 minus theta. And in fact, if the likelihood function looks like e to the minus something squared, then what would the logarithm look like? You just get rid of the e part, and it looks like minus something squared. It looks like a, a quadratic, right? And because of the minus sign, it looks like a bowl-shaped down parabola. And so if the likelihood function looks like that, then the logarithm of the likelihood function just has to look like a bowl-shaped down parabola, 
And indeed, it does. And now the log likelihood function has numbers like minus 192, and those are all perfectly numerically stable. So these days, we would prefer making calculations for likelihoods on the log scale, especially with large sample sizes, to, to remove the, prob the problem of underflow. For Fisher, he preferred to work on the log scale because that's where all the good math occurs. He proved all his theorems about what's going on with the logarithm of the likelihood function. And we also know um, that it's got to just be easier to work with because uh, it's always harder to work with products than it is to work with sums. So in this case, as is often true for large n, the log likelihood function looks, the jargon is locally quadratic around its maximum. And that brings me to Fisher's ad hocery. He said, that's not a density. No, 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 it's not a density, because if it were a density, you'd be thinking like a Bayesian. Uh, that's just a function of theta, and I want to summarize it. And Fisher said, trust me, find its maximum value. Find the theta that makes that function as large as it can possibly be, and trust me, that's going to be a good estimate. That was Fisher's story. It was, it was an, initially an ad hocery, and then he provided a narrative for why it was a good thing to do. And we will see later on un, what conditions what are the conditions under which it does provide a good story, and what are the conditions in which it doesn't? So this is called the theory of maximum likelihood because he's finding the place that maximizes the likelihood function. He gets a single value of theta from that, theta hat, and um, he's going to use that as his so-called point estimate. That's his single best guess for what theta is. And in fact, when we write out the log likelihood function, um, what's the calculus operation for finding maxima? Differentiation. Once it's differentiated and set to zero, if it's well behaved, and look, it is well behaved. It has a unique global maximum. Um, and once again, we see that the log likelihood function is a better scale to be working on because the differentiating products is a bane in the ass, right, um, compared with differentiating sums. But is that OK? If I maximize the likelihood function and you maximize the log likelihood function, will we get the same thing? And the answer is yes, because the logarithm is a monotone increasing function. And so if I go at the likelihood function and maximize it, and you go at the logarithm of it, we have to find the same point theta that maximizes them both, because log is increasing. All right? Um, by the way, uh, another important by the way is something really interesting about this likelihood function. Um, the left-hand side says, I offer you the whole data vector y and ask you to evaluate the likelihood for the value theta given y. But notice that y does not appear directly on the right-hand side. It only appears through a number which is based upon y, namely the sum of the y values. And that's actually something that was really thrilling to Fisher because he lived in an era where large data sets were very difficult to work with computationally. Obviously, they didn't have computers in 1925. What they had, the height of computing innovation was an old thing called a, a miracle calculator. It was one of these things where you punched buttons in and pulled a big lever like on a slot machine, and it multiplied for you. That was the, that was the height of, of computational complexity in 1925. So he would like to try to find, if he can, a way to do dimensionality reduction from 400 dimensions. So the, right, the left-hand side involves a, a, an object that's 400-dimensional right there and an object that's one-dimensional. He would like to do dimensionality reduction if he can. And what does this formula say? Do you need to know the entire data vector in order to be able to evaluate the likelihood function at any point theta? The answer is no. All you need to know is a one-dimensional summary of the entire vector, data vector, namely its sum. And he gave that a name, which is an important idea in Bayesian work as well. Anytime you can find that the, like, the, the likelihood function depends on the data vector only through some summary, that thing is called a sufficient statistic. And Fisher would say that, that little s, the sum of the y's, is sufficient for theta in the Bernoulli sampling model. So this has proven that s is a, a sufficient statistic. And this was great. Fisher really liked this because that meant that he only had to carry around a one-dimensional number in evaluating the likelihood function, not a 400-dimensional vector. It's pretty interesting. It says that for the purpose of learning about theta, all the vectors that have the same sum are equivalent, completely equivalent. And the order in which the ones and zeros were there in order to arrive at that sum is utterly irrelevant. You can throw it away. 
For that reason, Fisher always recommended, as soon as you found the sufficient statistic in your model, it doesn't always exist, but as soon as you found one, oh, go ahead and throw the data vector away. You don't need it anymore. But that also turns out to be too glib because what information is there present in the order of the ones and zeros that might actually help you in this problem? His function here says none of that other information will help you to learn about theta, but what would that information help you with? It gives you a sense of time trend in the data, and in particular, if it had some kind of temporal regularity rather than a kind of random irregularity, then you would have reason to suspect the IID model, right? And so what's really going on, and Fisher didn't understand this until much later in his life and wasn't even really all that willing to admit it then, he was, um, he was a guy with an ego the size of a bus, um, and uh, he really, really didn't like being... Um, shown to be wrong, and he was, of course, he was very opinionated, and if you're going to throw out 10,000 opinions in your life, some of them are going to be wrong. Um, so what's really going on is that the real, this is total information here. Um, this is the info about theta and from the sufficient statistic over here. And all of the other information in the total information in the entire data vector, y1 through yn, turns out to all be useful for an important task which Fisher never conducted in his life, namely model criticism. You can use all that information that is in some sense perpendicular to the information in the sufficient statistic to see if the model's any good or not. And Fisher never addressed that question. For him, in his whole lifetime, he never had any uncertainty about the right model to use. What a blessed world to live in. Wouldn't that be blessed uh, to live in if you never had any uncertainty about the model? Um, um, Fisher arrived at that, of course, just by putting blinders on, and, and we now uh, try to do better than that. But that's the real picture. Don't ever throw the data vector away. Obviously, there's lots of information orthogonal to or perpendicular to the sufficient statistic. Namely, all that information in there is for checking to see whether the model's any good or not. All right, so now we have Fisher telling us, like it says back here on um, this page of the notes, we have Fisher telling us that we should find the maximum of either the likelihood function or the log likelihood function. And that's easy enough to do. Um, we could use, if we were lazy, we could use something like maple um, to um, do the differentiation and set it equal to zero. And Maple or Mathematica, any of these symbolic computing packages that you may have access to, they can solve for maximum likelihood estimators in closed form, symbolic form. Um, or we could do it numerically, or we could do it our, our own sense symbolically by pen and paper. And it turns out here the calculation is easy. Take the derivative, the first partial derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to theta and set it equal to zero and solve. And the so-called maximum likelihood estimator, MLE for short, theta hat, just comes out to be the sample mean, which is already a kind of good intuitive estimate from the data of the population mean. So the function of the data that maximizes the likelihood or log likelihood function is called the maximum likelihood estimate theta hat subscript MLE. And as I mentioned before, um, well, I didn't mention this yet, but if I maximize the likelihood function and you maximize 10 times the likelihood function, we'll get the same theta for that maximum. That's like saying if I added a constant to the log likelihood function, we'd get the same maximum, which is true. And so his actual definition, as I did mention before, is any positive constant multiple of the joint sampling distribution, but reinterpreted as a function of the parameter for fixed data value. That's Fisher's definition. And that's helpful, basically, because we can use this constant to be the normalizing constant so this thing is a density and integrates to 1. And then we'll have this object called the likelihood density to go along with uh, what later on we're going to call the, the prior density and the posterior density. So from now on in this sort of work, lowercase c and expressions like that will be a um, just simply generic unspecified positive constant. And it will have the property that you don't have to pay attention to it in calculations. So c plus c equals c in calculations like that. c times c equals c. It's just something you don't have to worry about. So you just carry it along. So maximum likelihood has given us a basic principle 
uh, if you trust Fisher, that finding the maximum of the likelihood function is a good thing to do. And we'll see, as I said later on, why that might be a good thing to do. Um, he's now given you a general way to come up with point estimates in any problem that you can write down. You start by writing down the joint sampling distribution. You reinterpret it as a function of the parameters, take its logarithm, differentiate with respect to the parameter, and solve for zero, and that's your point estimate. That's a very general program for coming up with estimates of things. That's part of why his, his theory was so compelling in the year 1924 or so. He was giving people a general way to do this. And it turns out that that same idea works with when theta is a vector. Of, of parameters, of unknown parameters, of dimension greater than one, and I'll talk about that later on. So he's got, he's got something quite general, and people really liked it because it was so general. Um, as I said, Laplace already did it back in, in 1790, but uh, okay, and Fisher didn't know that. Um, he also proposed an approximation um, to uh, the measure, the thing that we would use to uh, come up with an, uh, a measure of uncertainty about this theta hat. And for that purpose, I want to go back over to Neyman's story. And before I do that, I want to make sure I don't ride roughshod over any of the breaks. Uh, we're supposed to have a break at, at uh, good, 3.45. Okay. Um, let's go back to that diagram that I had before, wherever it might have gone. Where are you? There you are. And now I'm going to pick up with this diagram again. And this diagram describes the way Mr. Naiman would have thought about doing inference in this problem. It turns out in this problem that Mr. Naiman's approach and Mr. Fisher's approach coincide in the sense that um, Fisher's um, maximum likelihood method has said that you should pay attention to the sample mean as a good estimate of the population mean. And what Mr. Naiman would have done, Mr. Naiman never really um, I'll tell you why, why they became enemies. Um, it's an interesting story. Um, Neyman was a Polish mathematician, and he started getting interested in statistics while he was still in Poland. And he discovered that the scope for being a statistician in Poland, an academic statistician in Poland, was very narrow in, the, in those days, the early 1900s. And he looked around and found that the, the really happening place for statistics in the early 1900s was England, which is the place that the discipline of statistics was invented around the year 1880 or 1890 by, uh, by uh, Francis Galton, who invented the, the uh, regression story you've heard before, and uh, Carl Pearson with chi-square and correlation and so on. Um, and so Neyman decided to come to England and make his way, his fortune in the world. Very smart guy. Uh, Fisher initially welcomed him. By the time Neyman arrived, Fisher, who was about 20 years older than Neyman, um, was, a, was the big man in statistics in, uh, in England and really in the world. And Fisher initially welcomed Neyman, but then um, Neyman started um, publishing papers in which he began to question some of Fisher's results. And Fisher didn't like that. Um, he, as I said before, was a guy who didn't like to be questioned. So um, in those days, and it's still true today, the Royal Statistical Society has a tradition of offering a small number of papers each year that are what are called red papers. The paper is said to be read before the society. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have three of those red papers of my own work in my lifetime, and I hope to have a fourth one fairly soon. Um, it was a, it's an honor in the British um, uh, statistics world to get one of these things. And Naaman, uh, and the way the red papers work is that um, they pick it out for discussion and you come into the Royal Statistical Society building on, on a particular evening, and you present your paper to the society. Everybody has had advanced copies of it beforehand. And then in the old days, um, people uh, would stand up from the audience and make comments about the paper. And there was an organized discussion and a disorganized discussion. The organized discussion consisted of two people. The society nominated two people, one called the proposer of the vote of thanks, and the other one called the seconder of the vote of thanks. And the proposer of the vote of thanks was chosen to be somebody who liked the paper and who started out by saying, this is a wonderful paper, and I'm going to talk about some things about why I think it's really wonderful, and here's some other ideas, and blah, blah. Then the seconder of the vote, and, and then they finished by saying, and I propose a, a, a vote of thanks to the, to the author of the paper for having given us such a splendid contribution. Then the seconder of the vote of thanks was chosen to be someone who was against the paper in some respects. And the seconder would still, was still supposed to be polite and say, 
boy, this is a really interesting paper, but I have some doubts, and uh, I think it should have been done this way instead, and blah, blah. And then that person always finished by saying, um, nevertheless, I, I second, I propose that we second the vote of thanks. Uh, and then the journal always says after that, the, the, the motion for thanking the speaker was passed by acclamation. And then the disorganized part of the, uh, of the discussion happens when everybody else in the audience who wants to talk goes up to the front and gives their comments. These days, there's still a proposer and a seconder. Uh, and there's still uh, an, a so-called disorganized discussion afterwards. But the disorganized discussion has two parts. You can either show up in London and read your discussion out while you're there, or else you can send it in by email, for example. And all of this stuff gets collected these days by the person who wrote the paper. And you assemble all this, this, this discussion material and look at all of it, and you get to write a rejoinder. You get the last word. And so you write a, a two or three page rejoinder, maybe even four or five pages in which you address all the points that you feel like addressing. And if someone has said something really embarrassing that you don't know how to address, you say something like, space does not permit me to address all the, <laughs> all the points raised by the discussants, and, and so on. But in the old days, um, you didn't actually present your discussion contributions in writing. And there was a secretary who actually had to sit there and, and write in shorthand uh, everything that was said. And it all got put into the journal verbatim. You can use JSTOR to go back and read the, the discussions of the red papers back in the 1920s. And you'll, you'll read this following discussion. So Naaman uh, presented this paper, which got chosen as a red paper before the RSS. Um, and it was over Fisher's objection, because it, it criticized one of Fisher's ideas. Uh, and the, the farthest the society was willing to go was to make Fisher the seconder of the vote of thanks on Naaman's paper. So Naaman reads the paper, and the proposer of the vote of thanks um, says great things about it, and I propose the vote of thanks. And then Fisher stands up, and he says, and you can read this in the journal, um, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Naaman back to the Royal Statistical Society. It is a pity, however, that he has chosen to speak this evening on a topic on which he knows absolutely nothing. <laughs> and then he goes on to rip Fisher, Naaman's contribution to shreds. And he conspicuously refuses to second the vote of thanks, the motion to the vote of thanks. And things go on from there. And then Naaman got his own, um, two, you know, got his own uh, two, or two nickel back in, in in the rejoinder and so on. It turned out that they were both right, and they were talking past each other in a point about the the, the meaning of the, the null hypothesis in a model they were working with. So, uh, and they didn't understand they were talking past each other. But from that moment on, um, Fisher regarded Naaman as a mortal enemy. And he blackballed him everywhere in England. Naaman started trying to apply for academic positions in England, and no one would hire him because, because Fisher had blackballed him. And so he decided to go somewhere else. And right around that time, the University of California was thinking of building a statistics department. In the, this was in the 1940s, right after World War II. And they reached out to him, and Naaman said yes, took a big, big leap, because um, even Cal Berkeley was not known in Europe as a very good school in those days. And, and he went and founded the stat department at Berkeley in the year like 1946 or so. So OK, so Naaman and Fisher had really different ways of thinking about inference. And this diagram here. Uh, is going to try to explain Naaman's way. So step one in Naaman's way is ad hoc, a little bit like uh, Fisher's was. Come up with what you think is a good point estimate for theta. In this case here, I'm going to use theta hat as a good point estimate for theta. Now Naaman says, I want to attach a measure of uncertainty to theta, to, rather to theta hat as a guess for theta. And I want to do so probabilistically. And so. Uh, and I have to stick within the repeated sampling story, because Naaman was an even more um, doctrinaire frequentist than, than Fisher was. Um, so he has to tell some kind of repeated sampling story. He wants to say, I'd like to know how good theta hat, 0.18, is, a guess, is as a guess for theta. And I want to measure the goodness in probability terms. So I want to answer questions like, what's the probability that theta hat and theta will differ from each other by no more than, let's say, 0.01? And so since he's using relative frequency probability, he has to now tell a repeated sampling story. He has to tell a story involving doing the same thing over and over again. And that's where the repeated sampling data set comes in in my diagram. Naaman says, even though it took you a lot of work to create that data set there, that sample that you've got, and even though it's the one and only one sample you're ever going to see, in order to tell a repeated sampling, a repeated frequency sort of narrative here, I have to imagine, I, Mr. Naaman, have to imagine you going out and getting another random sample. 
of size 400. And there would be a different theta hat in that one. And do it again, and do it again, and do it again, and collect all those theta hats into a new data set over there that I'm calling the repeated sampling data set. He didn't actually create this diagram. I created the diagram to help teach this stuff um, over the past 35 years, but, but you get the idea. So this is the actual sample up here. Here, we think about a hypothetical IID sample, also of size n equal 400, also consisting of ones and zeros. And it has some mean, which is also theta hat. But this theta hat, unlike the 0.18 up here, this theta hat is question mark, because I haven't done it yet. I'm just thinking about doing it. But an example of what my, I might get next time is example, I might get 0.20, for example. Now I imagine doing it again. I get another data set. Again, a hypothetical IID data set. This, all of this is in order to create a real meaning of probability in a relative frequency sense. He has to repeat the basic process of getting the theta hat over and over again in order to get the relative frequency machinery up and running. And so he gets another theta hat, which is question mark. Maybe this time he got 0.17. And so on, dot, dot, dot. Do that a lot. And now collect all those theta hats over here into this thing called the repeated sampling data set. So look, there's one now. And here's another one, 0.20. And here's another one down here, 0.17, and dot, dot, dot. And the thing about the repeated sampling data set is that now all of the uncertainty and the variability is in the theta hats. And he can tell you statements about how theta hat would behave if you were to get other theta hats using the, the relative frequency idea. And it's going to turn out that inside those statements, he can mix up the theta hat with the theta in such a way that he can create probability statements that look like they're probability statements about theta. And so he's able to do a trick that we're about to see. So if you trust him that this is a good thing to do, something cool happens in, in a minute. Um, now, ah, and you, and you, sir, he said you can do this in practice by taking repeated samples from your, sam from your own sample. You have just invented the bootstrap. <laughs> um, and in fact, I only invented this diagram. I only invented this diagram a couple years after uh, Brad Efren invented the bootstrap. And if I had invented this diagram in 1975, I could have invented the bootstrap myself. Because basically, his idea is a really good one. If you slide all these data sets over one and pretend temporarily that the sample equals the population and take repeated samples from your sample as if it were the population, that's another whole level of this same diagram that gets you even greater insights than Neyman had. That's a beautiful thing you just said. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Um, now, um, one cool thing about this is that you can either think about what would come out in this repeated sampling data set, or you could easily write a computer program to do it, right? Um, if I knew what the population was, just for the sake of writing a computer program, I could repeatedly sample in IID fashion 400 observations, get the mean, and do that over and over again, and collect them over here. For the purpose of learning about the probabilistic behavior of theta hat, would you like to have a small number of theta hats over here in the repeated sampling data set, or a large number, or in between? For learning as much as you could about the probability behavior over here, wouldn't you like to have as many of them as you could have? And so mathematically, we, would, we can't really do this in the computer, but mathematically, if we let capital M be the number of rows here, we'd like capital M to go to infinity. And then the repeated sampling data set consists of all possible theta hat values. And now, um, in the same way, when you, sim when you descriptively summarize data sets, I didn't do it in this one here, but if we would had a continuous outcome variable, you know that the three main things you always do with a continuous um, outcome to uh, summarize descriptively is you get the mean, you get the standard deviation, and you look at the histogram as a measure of what the distribution looks like. So I'm going to talk over here about the, those same three things, except I'm going to call them uh, the long run mean and the long run standard deviation and the long run distribution. Uh, and I'm going to do that because I'm talking about in the long run as capital M goes to infinity. We could simulate this process without much trouble in this box right here pretty quickly. And with an M of 10,000 or 100,000, we could get answers pretty quickly. But I want to imagine, for the sake of 
Uh, the very best answers would be arrived at by letting capital M go to infinity. And it turns out that you can answer all three of these questions mathematically. So um, I, it's time for our next break. When we come back, we will work out what each of those three things is mathematically. So I'll start again at uh, 345. Oh, did I do this wrong? Wait. Oh, oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have another 15 minutes till the next break. I'm sorry. Um, so sorry. Uh, so let's let's carry on. I, I can't even read my own chart. Um, the jargon in random variables for the long run mean of the theta hats, theta hat is now a random variable in this story, whose probability behavior over here in the repeated sampling data set is determined by this process of repeatedly getting theta hats. Look, the long run mean of all those infinite theta hats is the expectation of the random variable theta hat. And the long run standard deviation is the square root of the variance of that random variable theta hat. And the long run distribution is what we would usually call the sampling distribution, sampling distribution of the random variable theta hat. So all three of those things are uh, eligible for us to work out mathematically. Um, uh, you could call this the expected value of theta hat if you want, or just the expectation of theta hat. And we all know what the answer is. In IID sampling, the expectation of a sample mean is equal to what in, in relation to the population mean? It's the same, right? In, on average, in fact, that matches your intuition. If you did this over and over again infinitely and averaged all the resulting sample means, it would average out to the truth back in the population. That's like saying that the sample mean is a so-called unbiased estimate of the population mean here. So that number is theta, and we can prove that mathematically, or we could verify it with simulation. This thing here has another name. It's called the standard error, standard error of the random thing theta hat. That's equivalent to the square root of the variance of theta hat. It's a kind of standard deviation, but it's a kind of standard deviation where it's a standard deviation of the theta hats. It's not a standard deviation of the data values in the data set. It's a standard deviation of the theta hats in the repeated sampling data set. And so if I could remind you again, um, you already know these basic facts. If y1 through yn are iid from some distribution with mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma, then you know from your earlier work in um, uh, statistics that the expected value of the sample mean y bar equals the population mean mu. That's just like what we said a minute ago. And the variance of y bar in repeated sampling, does anybody remember what the formula is? Uh, in the variance scale, it would be sigma squared over n. And therefore, on the standard error scale, we would get just what she said, sigma over the square root of n. So we actually know in this problem here, because theta hat is, is actually a y bar in disguise, that's equal to the um, sigma over the square root of n, where sigma back here in this picture is the population standard deviation. And you can do some math without much difficulty to show that with ones and zeros data, if the mean is p or theta, let's call it theta, the standard deviation turns out to be the square root of theta times one minus theta. That just turns out to be a basic math fact with working with the binomials and Bernoulli story. And so that means that we've just worked out an important formula. The standard error of theta hat turns out to be the square root of theta times 1 minus theta over n. So that's going to be our formula that helps um, explain what's likely to happen over here. And how, there's one problem, little problem with Mr. Neyman's program. Is that formula usable for attaching a measure of uncertainty to theta hat as a good estimate of theta? Can I plug everything in that I know and get a number out on the right-hand side? Well, I know n. It's 400. But I don't know what theta is. That's the whole point. If I knew theta, I wouldn't be doing all this, right? So, so now we've arrived at a situation where the, the measure of uncertainty that we're going to use for our theta hat in turn depends upon the unknown theta. And so what would you expect would be a simple thing you could do that would you make it operational? Instead of talking about the standard error, we could start talking about the estimated standard error. And what should we do? Everywhere we see a theta, put in a, put in a theta hat. And so that's what Mr. Neyman did. Again, it's an ad hoc thing to do. And that's going to be our standard error. 
And so here, that's going to come out the square root of 0.18 times what's left from 1.82 over 400. And when you do that on your pocket calculator, you get 0 0.019, otherwise known as 1.9 percentage points. So that's the answer for the standard error. And so over here, I can write this in. I can talk about the estimated long-run standard deviation and put a hat over the standard error and write in 0.019. And so whatever this sampling distribution looks like, it's centered at the truth theta, and it has a standard error, an estimated standard error of 0.019. And so the final thing is to ask ourselves, what does that look like? And you guys uh, know the answer to that as well. I'm using uh, not numbering the pages right, but I'll fix that later. Does anybody remember a theorem that says what happens if you sample in an IID fashion from a population and get the mean and do that over and over again and collect all the means together? The distribution of the means is going to look a lot like the normal curve by the central limit theorem. And so the only question becomes, CLT for short, the only question becomes, um, is little n large enough? Because you remember the thing that makes the central limit theorem works is as long as little n is large, then you're going to get a nice normal curve here. No matter what is going on back in the population, you get a nice normal curve over here. Strictly speaking, as long as the, the standard deviation is finite of the population, you get a nice normal curve over here. All right. So, and I can tell you, we can, we can verify by simulation that you do get a nice normal curve over here. Uh, n, n equals 400 is, is plenty big enough. So let me draw that picture over again for us. This is the... Strictly speaking, it's the density of theta hat um, in repeated sampling. Oh, thanks. And we've just learned that it follows a normal curve centered at theta and with an estimated standard error of 0.019. Now, notice what's fixed and what's random in this story for Mr. Naiman. We got a theta and a theta hat. Is either one of them fixed in Mr. Naiman's story? Theta is fixed in Mr. Naiman's story. Is either one of them random in his story? Theta hat is random. We're going to find in the Bayesian story that that's exactly backwards. In the Bayesian story, theta hat is going to be the thing that we're going to treat as fixed because it's how the data came out. We have the one and only one data set in front of us, and we're going to treat theta as if it were like a random thing, as if it were a random variable in possession of a density in order to quantify uncertainty about it. That's one of the crucial things in the difference between the frequency and the Bayesian stories. In Mr. Naiman's way of looking at things, and the same for Fisher, theta hat is the random variable, and theta is the fixed unknown constant. So in Mr. Naiman's world, theta hat is the random variable, and theta is the thing that's fixed. So... Um, now, this is where Mr. Naiman's idea of confidence intervals came in. Um, he said to himself, uh, suppose I, you know about the normal curve, that if you start at the mean and go one standard deviation either way, you get about 68% in the middle. And probably you know also if you start at the mean and go two standard deviations either way, you get about 95% in the middle, right? That's a pretty famous thing. So if I go up to this place called theta plus 2 times 0.019, and down to this place called theta minus 2 times 0.019. And of course, the strictly squeaky clean number there is 1.96 rather than 2, but uh, it doesn't matter that much for what we're doing. You get 95% of the area under the normal curve in doing that. So watch quick, watch carefully as Naaman does uh, what I'm going to call Naaman's confidence trick. The frequentist probability that theta hat lies between theta minus 0.038 and theta plus 0.038 is approximately the approximation coming from the uh, central limit theorem and from hoping that the model is, is a reasonable um, expression of reality. Is that, a, is that a correct frequentist statement, probability statement, about the random variable theta hat? It says if we're thinking of theta hat as the random variable, and theta as the fixed number, 
whatever theta is, if you and I and all of our friends went out and did this over and over again, 95% of the time, your theta hats would fall in the interval theta minus point, plus or minus 0 0.038. Is that a correct probability statement in the frequency world? It sure is. But now, here's Mr. Neyman's confidence trick. He rearranges those inequalities, and it also becomes this statement. Is that also a correct frequentist probability statement? Answer, yes, because all I did was simply algebraically rearrange the inequalities. I, I switched where the theta and the theta hat were, and I put the theta in the middle. But look, it looks like a probability statement about theta now, because theta is in the middle. And so Neyman said, because this looks so much like a probability statement about theta, I'm just going to tell you that theta hat plus or minus 1.96 estimated standard errors of theta hat. I'm going to call that, he's going to say, is a 95% confidence interval. or theta. And it is a correct um, Frequentist statement. It's still true that that occurs with Frequentist probability, 0.95, but you have to be prepared to interpret it in the right way for Neyman's idea to work. Theta hat is the thing that's random in this story, in that probability statement there. Theta is the thing that's fixed. Now, let's work that out here and see what it is. Here, that becomes 0.18 plus or minus, let's say, 0.04, roughly. So that's an interval that runs from 0.14 to 0.22, if I did that approximately right. So now, can I make the frequentist statement that the probability that theta is between 0.14 and 0.22 is about 0.95%, 0.95%. I just got done. Fisher, Neyman says, that's a valid probability statement. So I evaluate it on my data set, and there it is. Is it now a correct Frequentist probability statement? Well, it can't be, right? Because in Neyman's world, what logical status does theta have? It's just a fixed unknown constant. It's not allowed to have a probability statement about it. And so this can't possibly be right. In Neyman's world, this probability is undefined. And yet, he's telling us that um, in some sense, with high confidence, theta should be found in the interval from 0.14 to 0.22. Notice he didn't say it's a 95% probability interval for theta, because if he'd done that, he would have had to try to be a Bayesian. He said it was a confidence interval. And so now, this is Neyman's confidence trick. He started out with a probability statement, and he's done a confidence trick in switching the role of theta and theta hat algebraically, and then helping us interpret it as if it were something like a probability statement about theta, but he can't really. So what is the actual basis of his confidence interval idea? Can you draw a picture that shows what Neyman had in mind? Answer yes, so let's do it. So here's theta. Now, you go out and take your random sample and build your interval. Maybe it looks like that. They're all symmetric, right? They all have to be symmetric in this way using the center limit theorem. Let's agree to call that one a hit because it includes the right answer. Unknown to us, we don't know what theta is. And you can always do this in your computer, right, and pretend you do know what theta is and, and run simulations to see how it goes. Now I go out and do the same thing. I take another random sample from the same population, and maybe I get this time here, I get one that's wider and centered over there, for example. But look, that one's also a hit. Now the third person does it, and they get one over here, and that one missed, so that's a miss. And the fourth person does it again, and they get one that looks like this. And that's another hit, and so on. We can imagine doing that out into the indefinite future. What is it that Mr. Neyman is warranting occurs 95% of the time? That you get 95% hits. In other words, his confidence is not in the interval. His confidence is in the process that led to the interval. He can't tell you for sure whether your interval is a good one, is a hit or a miss. The only way to know whether your interval is a hit or a miss is to go and do a complete census on the whole population and find out what theta really is. But if you went to all that trouble, then you shouldn't even have had to build the interval, right? So um, this is the calibration idea from Neyman. He's created a method of giving us intervals, 
And he can warrant mathematically that if the model is a correct representation of reality, and you were to go out and do this over and over again, you would be, getting, you would be using a process that generates a good interval about 95% of the time. And so basically all he can say with his approach is that his faith, uh, our confidence, we get basically the answer is we get 95% hits. Our confidence is in the process, not in any single interval. OK. And so now it really is time to take our next break. And I'll come back at 4 and tell you uh, a bit more about that. So we'll start again at 4. OK, let's begin again, please, for our final session today. Um, I would like to ask you again about the pace. So same form as before. Just put an X or a, craw, a check mark or something, and whether the pace for you is too fast or about right or too slow, shoot that around the room for everybody and uh, bring it up at the end. That'd be great. Thank you. So now um, we're back to, uh, I'm going to uh, fill in the rest of Fisher's approach. So you remember Fisher starts at the same point that Naaman does about a good point estimate here. He says, OK, the mean. And Naaman got his mean, uh, his y bar idea just by intuition. He said, well, uh, if you're using random sampling, the sample mean should be a good guess for the population mean. So I'm just going to say that theta hat equals y bar is a good estimate, and then I'll do my, my repeated sampling story on there and build his confidence interval. Um, Fisher gets the same answer, but a wholly different way, right? He writes down the likelihood function, takes its logarithm, differentiates, sets it equal to 0, and turns out the same answer. You get the same answer, s over n, the y bar, the mean. Now he wants to do something even more um, interesting, though. He wants not only to come up with a general way to estimate unknown things, he wants to come up with a general way to calibrate those estimates. So he agrees with Naaman that the repeated sampling variance of the maximum likelihood estimate is the thing he's interested in, just like we had in that diagram I showed a minute ago. Except he's going to think about, just like we did a minute ago, the estimated repeated sampling variance of the MLE. And this is a good problem to work on uh, here, because we actually know already from uh, calculations like Mr. Naaman made what the right answer is. I showed you already that the repeated sampling variance of the sample mean in this problem is theta times 1 minus theta over n. And therefore, the estimated repeated sampling variance should be theta hat 1 minus theta hat over n. So whenever you're trying out a new idea, it's a good plan to pick a problem where you know what the right answer is already. And then you try your idea and see if you get back the right answer. So this is a good problem to try that in. So um, Fisher did not derive this result in this manner. But I'm going to suggest to you that here's a good way to think about how he got his result. So. Um, So I'm going to draw the log likelihood function. And we, since we agreed the likelihood function was only defined up to a positive constant multiple, when I take the logarithm, that means the log likelihood is only defined up to an adding or subtracting a positive or negative number. So I'm going to shift vertically the log likelihood function so that its maximum occurs right at the MLE 0.18, which is theta hat. And you saw that it was bowl shaped down, looking like a parabola, bowl shaped down parabola, roughly centered right there. That was the picture for n equals 400. And the um, likelihood picture on the likelihood scale that goes along with that is uh, something that looks like a normal curve, except as I told you, this is L of theta given y. And this is theta going this way. And this is the log likelihood function, which I'm going to write as LL of theta given y. So this is, again, theta going this way and the, log, the likelihood function of theta going that way. So up here on the log likelihood scale, the picture looks like that. And now I want to imagine what the picture looks like with little n equals 1,600 instead, a data set that's four times larger, but also still has the same MLE, the same mean of 0.18. And I'm going to, again, renormalize that additively on the log likelihood scale so that the picture goes through that same point right there. So both of these log likelihood curves go through exactly the same point, namely uh, 0.18 comma 0. What will the log likelihood function look like 
with more data. It will still be bowl-shaped down, and it's still going to go through that point, but will it be spread out more, or will it be concentrated more? It'll be more concentrated. It'll look like this. This is the picture for n equals 1,600. That's on the log scale, and that corresponds to the, on the likelihood scale, it looking like this. And again, um, Fisher's not allowed to say this, but the reason this is happening is the uh, Bayesian version of the central limit theorem. With more data, we're getting uh, a likelihood density that looks more and more like a normal curve with a smaller degree of uncertainty connected with it. But Fisher's not allowed to say that because that would have made him a Bayesian. Now, what is the difference between those two functions on the log likelihood scale? At the maximum, they both take on this, the value zero, so there's no difference there at all. What about their first derivative? at the maximum. It's the same. It's zero for both of them. So what calculus aspect would distinguish those two curves at the maximum? The second derivative. And so Fisher said, I think a central item that has a lot to do with the accuracy of the maximum likelihood estimator is the second derivative of the log likelihood function evaluated at the MLE. The bigger that number is negatively, the less uncertainty I have because you can see it right in front of you, right? And so since it always comes out with a minus sign in front of it because it's always bowl shaped down, let's talk instead about minus the second derivative of the log likelihood function evaluated at the MLE, and we want that number to get bigger and bigger. He called that information, the information in the sample, or something. Yes, he called that the information in the sample. And afterwards, in his honor, people began calling it Fisher information. In fact, there turned out to be two kinds of information. Uh, so-called observed information and expected information, and this one is actually technically the one called uh, observed information. So, in the language of this case study, oops, Fisher noticed that if the sample size n increases while holding the MLE constant, the second derivative of the log likelihood function, which is a negative number, increases in size. And this led him to define the information in a sample about theta under the, the Bernoulli sampling model. It's now called the observed Fisher information, which I'm going to call I hat evaluated at the MLE minus the second derivative of the log likelihood function evaluated at theta equals theta hat MLE. And you saw that this quantity increases as n goes up, and that corresponds to having more information as the sample size increases. So that's a good name for it. Now, but we were trying to come up with a repeated sampling variance, and we know that as the sample size goes up, the variance should instead go down. And so now information is a great concept, but it goes in the wrong direction. As n goes up, the information goes up, and we want the variance to go down. And so we have to come up with some function of the information that has, a, has a, uh, an inverse relationship to the, the information. And the very simplest such uh, uh, relationship is, is, the, uh, is the reciprocal. And Fisher was able to show um, by making uh, Taylor expansions of the log likelihood function around the, the maximum that the repeated sampling variance of the maximum likelihood estimate, the estimated repeated sampling variance of the, est of the maximum likelihood estimate, is approximately given by 1 over the Fisher information number. And then to get a standard error, you just have to take the square root of both sides of that. So he now has a general way to calibrate his maximum likelihood estimates. He says, take the second derivative of the log likelihood function. And by the way, he reminds us that we really should have taken the second derivative of the log likelihood function back when we were computing the MLE anyway. Why should we have done that? When you're trying to find the maximum of a function, to prove it's, it's, a, it's act, an actual global maximum, you have to look at the second derivative and show that it's everywhere negative, for example. That would show that your, your extreme point is the global maximum. So his real program says, start with the sampling distribution, convert it into the likelihood function by thinking of it as a function of theta for fixed y, take the logarithm, take the first and second derivatives of the logarithm of the likelihood function, set the first derivative of the log likelihood function equal to zero and solve for theta to get the MLE. Check, plug that into the uh, second derivative of the log likelihood function and see if you get a number that's negative. Hit that with a minus sign, that gives you Fisher information. 
take its reciprocal and square root, and you've got your standard error. So he's got a really simple program. And this turned out to be the basis of, of the large majority of statistical work from 1925 when he published these results all the way up probably until the 1970s. It was what everyone in the world was doing as a way of, of getting point estimates and getting uncertainty bands for them. And he made a bunch of other, um, he, he was able to show a bunch of other things. Um, he showed the following thing. In fact, you, you, you can show in this problem, I haven't done the arithmetic for you here, but you can show by doing the, the second derivatives and so on that the information comes out just like that in this problem. And Fisher's idea is exactly the same answer we got before. And so on this problem, it's gotten precisely the right answer. Um, he further proved the following three, the following two things, A and B. Firstly, it turns out that in large samples, the maximum likelihood estimator is approximately unbiased, which means that in repeated sampling, the long run average of those theta hats in my repeated sampling data sets will approximately be equal to theta. He also showed the bias when it exists is of order 1 over n. And so it goes to 0 rapidly as the sample size increases. So unlike, um, I've been working with an epidemiologist uh, at uh, UC San Francisco. Um, he, he was shocked to discover that the maximum likelihood estimator can be unbiased. And in fact, it can be unbiased. I'm sorry, can be biased. And in fact, it can be badly biased in small samples. Um, that was a real shock to him. That's basically, Fisher knew that already, he, and he, he proved about it. But the, the bias term goes to zero at an order one over n rate, and so it goes away pretty quickly as your sample size increases. And moreover, he was able to show that the repeated sampling distribution of the MLE in large samples is approximately Gaussian, centered at the truth, and with estimated variance given by that expression there. And so even though Fisher would, would never call it a confidence interval, because that was Neyman's word for it, and Neyman was his hated opponent, um, an approximate 95% name, uh, Fisher would have just called it a 95% interval. He would never use the word confidence. So he would say a 95%, he might have said a 95% likelihood interval for theta is given by starting at the MLE and going plus or minus about two estimated standard errors either way, where you get that by working out the Fisher information and taking its reciprocal. So that's a completely general program for creating approximate point estimates in one dimension, where theta is a, is a one dimensional unknown and approximate uncertainty bands for that unknown. That was tremendous technology for the 1920s. The analogous answer in the Bayesian story, which we'll, which we'll derive next time, it looks like. We'll begin to look at it today, but we'll mostly derive it next time. The analogous answer in the Bayesian realm involves integrals. And you'll notice that the calculus machinery of Fisher's answer is based solely upon differentiation. You just have to take the first and the second derivatives of the log likelihood function. That made Fisher's technology a perfect technology for 1925, because anybody can differentiate. Integration, particularly as we're going to see later on in high dimensions, integration is a very difficult problem and cannot be solved in closed form often, and is quite difficult to approximate in high dimensions without a, without a really good algorithm and a fast computer. And so one reason that this, the 20th century was mostly a frequentist century is the pragmatic reason that even if Bayesians had tried to do their calculations in a, in a year like 1925, they wouldn't have been able to do them very well. They would only have been able to do approximate Bayes calculations that would have reduced pretty much to Fisher's maximum likelihood calculation. But the Bayesian story has sharp advantages over the maximum likelihood story when you don't have much data. And in precisely those situations, Bayesians could not actually do the integrals anyway in 1925. So the thing that, that's so great about maximum likelihood is it was a technology that was perfectly at, for the moment in which it was invented. And for decades thereafter, everybody can differentiate. Everybody can differentiate twice. It's not that hard. Let's do it. Now, if you take the first derivative of the log likelihood function and set it equal to 0, will it always have a closed form solution analytically? Can you guarantee somehow by some magic dust that when you write that equation down and try to solve for theta, it will always have a closed form solution? Well, no. But you can solve it approximately using numerical methods, right? And you can also, uh, then once you've got the MLE, solving it approximately by numerical methods, you can evaluate minus the second derivative at the log, uh, the log likelihood function at the MLE and get a number and just do Fisher's program. So even when the MLE is not available in closed form, you can create a little newton raphson sort of iterative scheme to, to figure it out um, uh, uh, numerically. Did you have a? And then I'll get to you. Uh, I just mean um, it happened in this particular problem that when we take the 
first derivative of the log likelihood function and set it equal to zero, you can solve for theta in closed form and it comes out equal to S over N. It just works. I didn't show you, but it just works. But that is not always true. There are lots of problems where when you try to solve for um, the uh, setting the first derivative of the log likelihood function equal to zero and solving for the unknown parameter, there is no closed form solution to the equation, particularly when the parameter is involved, is involved in the log likelihood function in expressions involving things like gamma functions and things like that. There's never going to be a closed form solution to that analytically. So you have to use numerical methods. What was your question or comment? Ah, good question. Um, in, in nice parametric problems, the log likelihood function is globally quadratic approximately quadratic and therefore also locally quadratic around the maximum. So nothing in terms of multiple modes can ever happen. In not nice parametric problems, the likelihood function can have multiple modes. Um, and uh, it requires some pretty complicated likelihood structures to get multiple modes. Um, if you, any of you ever do anything involving spatial statistics, there's this thing called the icing model for spatial statistics, and you get these log likelihood surfaces that look like egg cartons. Um, there's all these little teeny local maxima of the log likelihood function. Uh, nasty business. I don't want to talk about it now. <laughs> um, in all the problems we're going to look at for weeks and weeks in this class, um, we're never going to have anything but, um, but strongly unimodal um, likelihood functions, so, so no worries there. This multimodality you're talking about is also a threat to the Bayesian computations as well, and I will talk more about that later on. The so-called Markov chain Monte Carlo method that everybody uses these days is in deep trouble when you have multiple modes and you don't do the MCMC in the right way to find the other modes. It's in deep trouble. So both likelihood and Bayesian methods have trouble with multimodal likelihood functions. Uh -huh. Um, there are, uh, of course, in this specific example, we didn't have to make any regularity assumptions because everything was really nice. There are uh, some regularity assumptions under which the maximum likelihood story that I mentioned, all these things here, the, this is a theorem that has some, some regularity conditions in it. You're right, there are some things to worry about. Um, you want a finite second moment. In other words, you want a finite variance the same way you do with the central limit theorem working for you. Um, and there may be some other regularity conditions I'm forgetting now, but basically they're quite mild and they tend not to be violated by re by real in real problems solving. So, um, okay, so um, that's Fisher's way of doing it, and it turns out you'll notice it turns out to match the same interval that Neyman got, although by quite different methods. Fisher went at it with his likelihood function. Neyman went at it with common sense and repeated sampling calculations in the central limit theorem. Uh huh. It's the square root of the variance. Um, uh, it is possible to. Uh, what am I doing? Page down. That's not what I want. Page up. Where am I? Yeah, here I am. Okay. So it was back here somewhere. For example, oh, one of the paper styles. Oh, I'm in trouble on that. They're all mixed up now. Um, uh, basically, um, if you're trying Fisher's approach, if your question is about Fisher's approach, um, there will typically not be any difficulty in computing the second derivative of the log likelihood function. You just do it um, analytically. Uh, and then have, having solved the first derivative equation to get the MLE, you just plug that number into the second derivative equation and put a minus sign in front of it, and that gives you Fisher information. So there aren't any analytical difficulties that can arise. For Neyman, for, for Neyman, Neyman has to, uh, yeah, you're right. Let me, let me find that slide. So here's, um, here's uh, Neyman's, here's Mr. Neyman's diagram. Uh, although, as I said, he didn't invent this diagram, but this is the diagram that, that covers Mr. Neyman. Um, here's part of the ad hocery of, of um, uh, the frequentist approach. Um, suppose this was a continuous distribution over here in the, in, this, in the population rather than the ones and zeros. And yet you're interested, and suppose that you believed, based on the science of the problem, that the population distribution of the outcome variable was symmetric about the midpoint which corresponds to the mean, of course, then, if it's symmetric by uh, 
the point of symmetry has to be the same as the mean by the basis of the balancing point. Then I could have invented the ad hoc idea that the sample mean is a good guess for the center of symmetry. And you could have invented the ad hoc idea that the sample median is a good guess for the center of symmetry. And there is nothing in Mr. Naiman's program that says automatically which of us is better than the other one. He would have, if the median guy would have gone through this exact same program, except he would have had a harder problem. He would have had to work out the expected value of the sample median and the repeated sampling variance of the sample median. And those are much harder calculations than if you were doing them for the mean. And much worse estimators can arise. And so um, basically, the Frequentist approach has the difficulty that it's based upon uh, uh, intuition and ad hocery. Some guy says, oh, I think the sample mean is a good guess for the center of symmetry. Some other guy says, oh, I think the sample median is a good guess. Um, Fisher actually had a way to serve as a referee in the dispute between those two people. And Fisher said the following. He said, well, first let's see if they're both unbiased. And if the distribution, the population distribution is symmetric, the median will turn out to be unbiased for the center of symmetry, as is the mean. So they both match on that criterion. But then Fisher said, if they both have the same unbiased characteristic, then in repeated sampling, one of them is better than the other when its repeated sampling variance is smaller than the other one, or equivalently, the repeated sampling standard error, which is the square root of the variance. And he was able to show, and I, I was just about to get to this on the next slide, that um, he showed something even stronger. Well, I want to be on that page. Where am I over here? Yeah. Um, he showed, first of all, we saw that um, the information in our uh, binomial, pro or rather our Bernoulli problem, went like n over a number. In other words, the information is order n. It goes up at the rate, at the rate of how many observations you have. Therefore, in regular, what are called regular parametric problems, and later on I'll show you some problems that aren't regular, um, the variance goes down like order 1 over n, and therefore the standard error goes down like order 1 over square root of n. Everybody knows that thing she said, that the standard error of the mean is sigma over the square root of n, and so that's where this comes from. Variance is order 1 over n, standard error is order 1 over square root of n. Um, and that means that uncertainty on the, about theta on the basis of the maximum likelihood estimate goes down like some number C subscript MLE over N on the variance scale. And what Fisher was able to show is that out of all the different ways you could think of estimating theta, each one of them would have a variance expression that's like this with a different number right there. And Fisher was able to show that the number right there in the numerator that goes along with the MLE is the smallest possible number. And so in other words, he was able to show in his jargon that the MLE is not only nice for other reasons, but it's also what he called efficient. It makes the most use of the data possible in large samples. So that basically settles the controversy. If, I, if I'm Joe Median and you're, you're um, Robert Mean, um, and we compute the maximum likelihood estimator, and it turns out that the mean is the MLE in this problem, then Fisher says, go with the mean, because it turns out to be the estimator that has the smallest possible repeated sampling variance. For those of you who ever took any math stat, this is also called the cremer rau lower bound, if that ever rings any bells with you. That Fisher actually did it before Cremer and Rao, but um, in, his, in his Taylor series expansion, it, it comes out of there. But anyway, um, so, and there's a reason why it is. It's going to turn out later on that maximum likelihood is simply approximating the right Bayesian thing to do. And the Bayesian story has been shown to be a completely the best possible information processing engine. So all he was doing was approximating the best thing and talking about it in frequentist terms instead of Bayesian terms. No wonder it's efficient. It's just approximate Bayes. Now we get finally to the Bayesian story that's in parallel with this frequency story. Um, as a Bayesian, um, there are several ways to think about this problem. Um, but the one I'm going to tell you about here is my, is my favorite one. Um, it's due to work by that Italian statistician I mentioned before, Bruno De Finetti. Um, De Finetti had a wonderful um, program in mind as follows. He said, um, there's a big difference between parameters on the one hand, which are features of a population that are almost always unobservable. You're never going to actually get to see them. 
There's a big difference between unobservable parameters on the one hand and observable data values on the other hand. And the big difference is that if you base your thinking about observables and you're able to actually observe them, then in an engineering sense, you have the possibility of an automatic feedback loop. You can go around predicting observables, and then you see whether you were right or not. Were your predictions close to the right thing that actually happened? And if they're not, you go back and change your model until you make it better. So De Finetti's approach was actually a kind of engineering approach based on the notion of feedback loop, although he didn't use those words. He said, we should try to build our models on the predictive scale rather than on the inferential scale. That way, when we get answers out, we can compare our predictions with reality. And if they don't match very well, that provides a basis for going back and fixing the models until they do match reality. Um, I would actually like to interrupt myself before I go on on that line of, of reasoning to pick up again on this idea of, of unobservable uh, parameters. Um, the, uh, those of you who've built a confidence interval in your life, and that probably includes a good number of people in the room, I bet, when was the last time you ever found out whether that confidence interval was a hit or a miss, whether it really did include the truth or not? Probably the only time it ever happens in our lifetimes is when we create simulation environments in which we know what the right answer is and we look and see how often the intervals include the truth. That's just about it. Um, the only other time I can imagine is the following story. I imagine uh, I go to, I die and I try to go to heaven. So I'm at, uh, waiting at the pearly gates and uh, uh, St. Peter shows up uh, and he says, oh, a statistician. Um, um, uh, uh, it's, you're going to have to wait a little while for your appointment with God. She's pretty busy today, but uh, I'm going to, uh, since you're a statistician, I'm going to uh, amuse you. Um, uh, so he takes a piece of paper out of his back pocket and he says, um, okay, so you remember back in 1993 when you were working with that drug company and you said that theta was between five and seven. <laughs> well, you were right that time. <laughs> And that other time when you were working at Yahoo back in 2006 and you said that um, Lambda was between 5 and 9, well, that, you, you were wrong about that one. In fact, I've got your whole scorecard here in my back pocket. And across all the 95% intervals in your life that you made, um, they included the right answer 93.8% of the time. So I, so I guess that's close enough to have an interview with God. right? Um, so uh, that's about the closest you ever get to, to finding out, so to speak, whether your intervals really include the truth. Either you run a simulation study or you wait to talk to St. Peter. That's, that, 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 that's about it. And so um, uh, Fisher, or rather, De Finetti's story is wonderful because he emphasizes building models on the scale of predicting observables instead. And a marvelous thing happens. It turns out for at least some models that if you build a model on the predictive scale, there is one and only one inferential model that, that matches that in order to be logically internally consistent. So his program actually works in some situations directly because he wants to build predictive distributions for things you can see, and that's going to turn out to imply inferential models. And sometimes it does so in a one, one and only one way sense, and that's the best possible situation. So in De Finetti's way of looking at things, in this heart attack case study, my job is to quantify my uncertainty about those 400 ones and zeros that I'm going to get to see once the data starts arriving. In other words, in De Finetti's way of looking at things, my initial modeling task is predictive rather than inferential. And there isn't, initially, there isn't any samples and population story in the Bayesian approach. In the Bayesian story, you don't have to think about other data sets than the one you actually got. In the Frequentist story, you all the time have to think about other data sets than the one you got because that's the basis of the third column in my diagram, right? You have to imagine getting other random samples. In the Bayesian story, you're only going to get one data set. You're, you're never going to be another one. So you, you only have to think about the data set you've got. But probability and things that behave like random variables do arise, in, but in a completely different way. I use the machinery of random variables to quantify my uncertainty about things. So we're going to making, be making calculations in which theta is manipulated as if it were a random variable. It's not really a random variable. It's really a fixed unknown constant. But I'm going to use the machinery of probability distributions as a means of quantifying my uncertainty about it. And so if you are more comfortable with thinking of it as a random variable, that's OK. But it's really not a random variable. It's really just a fixed unknown constant. And we're going to use the machinery of probability distributions to quantify uncertainty about it. That's the way the Bayesian story actually goes. And the, the verb is to elicit from yourself a joint predictive distribution that accurately, accurately captures your judgments about what you'll see. 
So this is the, my Bayesian predictive distribution for whether the first patient will die or not, and whether the second patient will die or not, and so on, all the way down to whether the 400th patient will die or not. And notice that in the frequentist approach, the random variables describe the process of observing the repeatable event of getting another random sample, whereas in the Bayesian approach, I'm using random variables to quantify my uncertainty about observables that have not yet been observed. So um, two different ways to think about how random variables are coming into the story. Now, uh, I would like to do this elicitation in a way that after the fact I regard as good. And so I have to begin thinking about what I might mean by the word good. And I'm going to argue later as we go along in the short course that the concept of probabilistic accuracy has to be examined along two dimensions. I want my uncertainty assessments to be internally consistent. And it's going to turn out that the Bayesian story guarantees that. We can never end up with negative estimates of variances, for example, whereas you can in the frequentist approach. I want my uncertainty assessments to be internally consistent, and the Bayesian story gets me that via this notion of coherence or Richard Cox's idea of logical internal consistency. And I want my uncertainty assessments also to be externally consistent, and that corresponds to that frequentist idea of calibration that I mentioned before. But as we're going to see in the Bayesian story unfolding, nowhere in the pure Bayesian narrative by itself does the calibration idea ever appear. It's just not part of the machinery. And that could be regarded as a big flaw in the Bayesian story, at least in my view, because I think the business of, as I said at the beginning, of asking the question, how often do I get the right answer, is an even more fundamental and primitive scientific question than the issue of frequency versus Bayes. You've got to ask about any method you invent for separating signal from noise, how often are you getting the right answer? And so calibration is central. And if it's not built into the basis of the story, then we have to build it in somehow. Yeah? Well, um, I haven't seen the ones and zeros yet. OK, so uh, this is right before 2006. And I'm thinking about the ones and zeros I'm going to see. There is no population. This is not a sample from any population. It's just a stream of ones and zeros I'm about to see. And I'm allowed to sit around before 2006 starts and think about what I think the, how the, no, there's no samples and populations here at all. Uh, and I just use probability to quantify my predictions by means of a joint probability distribution for these observables. Um, in this case, uh, in this problem, I knew N because I have records on about how many heart attack patients arrive at the Dominican Hospital every year, and it's about 100, and I wanted four years. Um, but you're right. Um, uh, I could, for instance, have said, I'm going to start sampling at, in January 2006. Not sampling. I'm going to start observing in January 2006, and I'll keep observing until I get the 400th patient. That's equivalent, for instance. Well, um, it's, it's even worse than what you're saying, because look at this thing. It's easy for me to write it down in symbols in LaTeX, but this is actually a 400-dimensional probability distribution. And we as humans have hard enough time thinking about three-dimensional probability distributions. How can you possibly even, it seems like Definetti's program is doomed from the beginning, because how can you begin to think about a 400-dimensional probability distribution? Well, Definetti understood that. And so he thought a bit more deeply than anyone had ever done before. And he was able to develop another kind of dimensionality reduction, different from Fisher's, that makes the problem, it turns out, much simpler. He says the following thing. Suppose I have no information at all that distinguishes one of these patients from the other patients. Suppose I have no covariate information at all. I don't know who's male and female. I don't know how old anybody is. I don't know who has diabetes and who doesn't have diabetes. I don't know anything about these people at all. Then my predictive distribution about those 400 ones and zeros would be the same no matter what order someone asked me to predict the patients in. Do you buy that? If I know nothing about these patients, then my uncertainty about patient 47 is the same as my uncertainty about patient 74. And moreover, if somebody like the Wizard of Oz behind the green curtain, if the Wizard of Oz were to randomly permute the order in which I were presented the patients, my predictive distribution would be the same. 
And that's a very cool thing to have observed. He gave it a name. He calls it exchangeable. He says that random variables y1 through yn are exchangeable if the distributions of y1 through yn and y pi1 through pi n are the same where pi1 through pi n is any permutation you want of the numbers from 1 to n. So this is a cool thing to have observed because it's a description of my uncertainty about the world, and it's a description of my uncertainty about the world that comes directly from the science of the problem. It doesn't involve any extraneous assumptions that I'm built and I'm piling on on top of things. I notice about my uncertainty about these ones and zeros that if I have no covariates, then my uncertainty about them is exchangeable. So it turns out that we don't want simply to elicit just any old 400-dimensional probability distribution where each of the variables in question is, is a 1 or a 0. I only want to think about all the 400-dimensional probability distributions that are exchangeable. And it turns out that set of distributions is much smaller. The exchangeability thing, it turns out, actually completely um, narrows down the field of, of predictive distributions that are worth considering. And he proved an incredible theorem. Well, it's, in, it's incredible that anybody could prove it. And then after he's proven it, you can say, oh, that's kind of obvious why you know, anybody should have known that. But it was actually a really hard thing to prove. He proved a theorem which we now call De Finetti's representation theorem in his honor, um, which uh, shows that if your uncertainty is exchangeable, then there is actually one and only one parametric model that could go along with that. So in other words, he starts with a model that's purely predictive on the scale of the ones and zeros. And, one, and adds the assumption of exchangeability, which comes directly from the science of the problem. And out at, from the other end of his theorem comes one and only one way that the parametric modeling can possibly uh, occur as long as your inferences are to be logically internally consistent. In order to not make any mistakes of that incoherence nature, then your model has to look like blah, blah. And I haven't said yet what blah, blah is. Cool, very cool theorem. First, I want to make a point. Exchangeability, the Bayesian idea of exchangeability and the frequentist idea of IID are not the same. IID is stronger than exchangeability. IID implies exchangeability. And if you think about that definition a minute ago, exchangeable random variables do have identical marginal distributions. So the first I in the phrase IID follows from exchangeability. But exchangeable random variables are not independent in the Bayesian sense. And here is a little argument that shows why. If I'm expecting, before I saw any data, about 15% ones, for example, which turns out to be the 30-day death rate for heart attack with average quality of care in this country, the knowledge that in the first 50 outcomes at the Dominican hospital, 20 of them were deaths. So in other words, having looked at the first 50 outcomes and seen that the, the running mortality rate so far is 40%, that would definitely change your prediction of whether the 51st observation were a 1 or a 0 or not. In other words, even though these things are exchangeable, there is information in any subset of them for predicting some of the other ones. And therefore, that means in a Bayesian sense, they're not independent of each other. So exchangeability and IID are not the same. IID is stronger than exchangeability. It implies exchangeability. And it's true that exchangeable random variables are identically distributed, but they are not independent. There is information in any subset of the exchangeable Ys that is helpful in predicting the rest of the Ys, and that makes them dependent in a Bayesian sense, and also in a, in a frequentist sense. Now, as soon as you've defined exchangeability, a uh, great thing to have defined, um, then you would begin to say, well, what happens if I do have a covariant? So for example, suppose it were true. Suppose I knew the, the, the gender of the uh, patients, male or female. And suppose it were true in the medical literature that men tend to have heart attacks at, uh, tend, tend, to ha tend to die at a, at a higher rate with a heart attack than women do. Um, I believe that is true, actually. Uh, and there's a genetic reason for it. Um, women have heartier health um, than men do. Women live longer, and they have stronger health. And what's the asymmetry in male-female in the way that the human race has evolved that would make that a, a good thing? What is the one thing that women do that men never do that affects their health? They have kids, right? And so we have evolved as a species for women to be healthier because they have to be able to bear the burden of childbirth. And so that's why, that's why more men are born than women. The frequency of males is a little bit bigger than females because the men are going to die faster than the women are. And that's why women live longer because we have evolved into organisms who 
need the women to be healthier because they are the ones that have to go through childbirth. Um, so it does turn out that, that men die of heart attacks at a higher rate um, than women do. Then if I had the covariate for male versus female, could I then continue to claim that my uncertainty about all 400 of the people was exchangeable? Well, no, because um, if I told you that person number 10 was a man and person number 12 was a woman, then my uncertainty about them wouldn't be the same anymore because I now know that one's a man and one's a woman. And the, the, the underlying propensity to get a heart attack is, is higher in the men than the women. So what could I do instead? Instead of asserting what you might call unconditional exchangeability across all 400 people, what would be the obvious thing to do? Partition the people into men and women, and you have conditional exchangeability inside the set of men and conditional exchangeability inside the set of women, but not unconditional exchangeability over everybody. So Definetti called that partial exchangeability, and in the paper on this that I wrote with other people uh, quite a while ago now, um, uh, we call it conditional exchangeability. So we would say that, um, that the mortality status is conditionally exchangeable given gender in the, this problem. And if you, there were any other covariates that um, were relevant, you need to bring them in as well to define the, uh, the degree of conditional exchangeability that's appropriate for your modeling. And you'll notice, if, you're, if you remember back, that this is quite close to Fisher's idea of recognizable subpopulations, that same thing we talked about earlier this morning. What are the factors that partition people into little groups within which your uncertainty about them is roughly constant, but between which they have quite different, quite different uh, stories. So Definetti starts and says, you should think about a 400-dimensional probability distribution, predictive distribution. We say, I can't think about that. It's too, it's too hard. It's too big. Definetti says, ah, but notice that your uncertainty is exchangeable in this problem. We say, so what? <laughs> Does that really change things much? And Dave says, oh, yes, I've proved a theorem. And it shows that it changes everything. The judgment of exchangeability still seems to leave the joint distribution of the Ys quite imprecisely specified. But Dave proved this incredible theorem. He says the following. I've got these Y1s through Yn's, right? I'm going to see these 1s and zeros out to n of them. And my uncertainty about them is exchangeable. If I'm willing to extend that judgment of exchangeability outward from y1 through yn out to y1 through yn plus 1, yn plus 2, dot, 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 all the way out to countable infinity, by which I mean that any subset of that countable set, my uncertainty would be exchangeable amongst everybody within that subset. Then he proves the theorem that says there's one and only one way to characterize your joint predictive distribution if it's to be coherent. It has to have, it has to satisfy a particular integral equation. It has to, in order to avoid people being able to make Dutch book against you. He proves this incredible theorem. Now let's stop for a second and see what it means to extend your, your judgment of exchangeability from a finite set to a countably infinite set. Well, If I start out being my uncertainty is exchangeable through y1 through yn, and then I say it's also exchangeable across all the other ones that could have been in this countable story, isn't that the same as treating that countable story as a population and regarding this as your sample from that population? And the answer is yes, because sampling at random from a population is exactly a way to create an exchangeable situation. And so when Definetti says, it sounds like something that, why would he have to assume that condition? That, you're, that you have to be prepared to extend your judgment of exchangeability outward from the data you've got out into this broader collective. That's just like inferring outward from a sample to a population. And so that same problem that we had before about what is the broadest scope of valid generalizability outward from our data set that so convincingly embarrassed the Frequentist position earlier, it has the same force of embarrassment with this story here. You cannot avoid, either in the Bayesian or the Frequentist paradigm, you cannot avoid having to face the issue of what is the population that you're inferring to. And De Finetti's version of it just takes this form here instead. The population he has in mind is that countable collective of all the ones and zeros out to infinity. And the 
y1 through yn is like a random sample from it. Uh -huh. Um, uh, it, it basically is, isn't it? Um, it's another way of saying that, except that um, the way I would try to make both Definetti and Fisher become more relevant is um, we would have to agree on who the other people are in the place called dot, dot, dot. And once we agree on who those other people are, then we really are having to define the population. So um, if the dot, dot, dot in our real problem includes other patients at other hospitals than the Dominican, then you have to make some kind of similarity argument. Why is it that Dominican people are, your uncertainty about them is exchangeable with these people and so on. So you're exactly right, except that the dot, dot, dot part is the crucial thing. If I want to apply this as a math theorem to the real world, I have to be prepared to say, who are the people in the dot, dot, dot? And that faces us with the same issue as before. Well, here comes Fisher, uh, here rather, here comes Definity's theorem. And it's going to take us longer than 15 minutes to digest, so I'm just going to have to tell you the story now. And it's kind of not a good time to have this, this break be in, last an entire week, because you're probably going to go away partially puzzled by what I'm about to show you now, because I, I need really, it would have been better if this came up at the beginning of a one-hour block and we spent most of the hour understanding this theorem, because it's, um, it's, it's right. Anyway, um, I'm just going to tell you the theorem. Uh, and um, then uh, I'll take a moment to explain what it means and then start next time by, by trying to go a little more deeply into uh, what it means and why it happens. So if here's his theorem. If you're willing to regard y1 through yn as the first little n terms in an infinitely exchangeable binary sequence, then it turns out, and we call y bar n the mean of the first n observations, then it turns out by exchangeability the limit of those y bar n's must exist, and we can give it a name. Let's call it theta. And moreover, theta has a dual meaning. It's not only what I would have just a minute ago called the population mean of all those ones and zeros in the countable collective, but it's also the marginal probability of any one of the yi's being a one. So if you knew what theta was, each of the yi's has to be Bernoulli with um, success probability theta. So we're seeing a direct connection with the Frequentist story. And of course, we have to, because the only possible distribution for ones and zeros is a Bernoulli distribution. And the only question about a Bernoulli distribution is whether everybody has the same theta or not. That's all you can do. If you've already got ones and zeros, all you can do is, um, is talk about them as Bernoullis, because that's their ones and zeros, right? But I, something I should have said before, and then I'll come back to the theorem. Um, the model we used before in shorthand looked like this. Uh, we said, if you knew what theta was, everybody would be IID Bernoulli with parameter theta. But wouldn't it actually be more realistic to try to build a model in which each patient had his or her own theta, in which each patient had his or her own underlying propensity to die from a heart attack? These are all people who are heart attack patients, but some of them are older than others, and some of them have comorbidities, as the doctors call it. Some of them have diabetes in addition to the heart attack and or hypertension and so on. Wouldn't it be really nice to be able to build a model in which everybody had their own thetas? And we can't call it IID anymore, but we could think of people behaving independently of each other, but everybody having their own theta. Wouldn't that be closer to the way you'd like to really model things scientifically as I runs from 1 to n? That's a good model scientifically. It's closer to reality because, at, in fact, everybody will have their own theta. What happens when you try to fit that model? And the yi's are either 1 or 0. You have n observations. How many parameters does the model have? n parameters and n observations. And the only thing you can do without any external information is anytime somebody's a 1, you estimate their theta to be a 1. And anytime you, someone gives you a 0, you estimate their theta to be a 0. So we would like to write this model down. Every time you write a statistical model down, you would really like to ha everybody have their own parameter vector. But as soon as you try to do that, naively you discover you can't fit that model because you have the same number of parameters as you have data points, and there's no information in the sample to, to help you estimate the parameters. Later on, though, we will see that this can be the first layer in what's later on going to be called a hierarchical model in which we tell 
a second level story about how the thetas are related to each other. And now suddenly the model becomes estimable and we can do real science with it. But the top layer of a model like this is a kind of wishful, wow, we wish we could fit that model scientifically, but we can't because there's too many parameters. So getting back to De Finetti's theorem. It's already pretty cool that under exchangeability, that limit has to exist. And if we call it theta, it's already pretty cool that that theta has to be the same as the marginal probability that everybody is a one. That always has to, that of course, had to be the same by, by exchangeability. But moreover, um, all, I'm going to forget about, there's some stuff about maybe you, maybe you have a density, maybe you don't. Let's pretend that everything is nice enough so that you, you have a density. Um, they finally was able to show that the only, that all, all logically internally consistent predictive distributions have to have this form here. You have to be able to express this distribution in this form here. And look, there's our old friend theta to the s, 1 minus theta to the n minus s again. And s is again the sum of the y's, n times y bar. So his theorem says, if you're prepared to think of your, your data set as like a binary sample from a larger population, then think about the mean of the ones and zeros in the whole population, call that theta, then your predictive distribution has to have this form for it to be internally logically consistent. And what is this form? What is theta to the s, 1 minus theta to the n minus s? That's the joint sampling distribution under the Bernoulli model. And the only thing that's different is we have to take a weighted average of that with respect to, to something p of theta. p of theta turns out to be a probability density on theta. In other words, popping right out of De Finet's theorem is that you have to be prepared to treat theta as like a random variable in possession of a density. And using our language from earlier today, what density is this? This is the prior distribution. All, all internally consistent predictive distributions have to look like Bernoulli sampling distributions weighted averaged against some prior distribution or another. And so this is the sense in which there's one and only one sampling model possible arising directly from exchangeability. Um, I think I don't have time to, oh no, this slide I just already told you about. So this is uh, um, this thing we said before. Uh, just it's there in the, in the notes for you. Um, I was able to embarrass the uh, the frequentist story earlier, but I'm now showing you that the same embarrassment arises uh, in the, uh, the Bayesian story as well. Um, and in order to really understand what's going on here, we have to go into an important digression. Uh, actually, I'm going to skip over that and and, and brief that stuff on uh, at the beginning next time. Uh, and I want to point out to you that essentially that predictive distribution I showed you a minute ago is equivalent to the following story. This is a kind of intuitive takeaway message of what De Finetti's theorem says. It says, if you are going to try to behave in a logically internally consistent fashion when you've got binary observables and your uncertainty about them is exchangeable, then you have to behave as if, firstly, there's a quantity called theta interpretable as either the long-run relative frequency of ones or the marginal probability that any of the single y's would be one. You need to treat theta as like a random quantity having a density, p of theta, and then conditional on this theta, the y's are i d Bernoulli theta. So basically, the sampling distribution is the same answer we got from the frequentist approach, except this line down here in the model is the same as before, except now in the Bayesian world, theta is treated like a random thing, so we're allowed to write down a conditional distribution for it, whereas in the frequentist story, we weren't before. So this turns out to be equivalent to our first example of a simple, what's called hierarchical model. And what it says here is there's a, it's a two-level hierarchy. There's a layer of uncertainty about theta, and then there's a layer of uncertainty about the y's conditional on theta. If you knew what theta was, you can use this to predict the y's at the second level. The second level is the same as the Frequentist story. And the first level says you have to treat theta as an unknown thing, as if it were behaving like a random variable and having a probability distribution. 
And what can that probability distribution be? It has nothing to do with the data, because the data part comes in right here, so it has to be the prior distribution. The generalization of the Bayesian story this morning, when we go away from Bayes' theorem on tr true-false propositions and we try to apply it to continuous unknowns, is that the thing that acts like the prior probabilities now becomes an entire prior density, and that's where it is right there. So this is a very, in a sense, all Bayesian models are hierarchical models in this sense here, because you start out with a, a model at the top layer that involves putting down a prior distribution on the parameters, and then you have a sampling distribution conditional on the values of the parameters. Every Bayesian model has this simple hierarchical character, and it comes directly out of De Finetti's theorem in this case here. Now, does that mean that every Bayesian will always get the same answer? on the same data set. No, because there's plenty of room in this way of looking at things to bring in any external information you have right through this distribution here. And so if you and I have the same data set and we model it in a Bernoulli fashion, and you and I differ in our external information, then the Bayesian framework allows for that, and we get different answers. And we don't know yet which one is better, but we know that they ought to be different because they involve different information sources, and they are different. And so that's what that he says to do. So this turns out to be the link between Frequentist and Bayesian modeling of binary outcomes. Exchangeability implies that I should behave like a Frequentist as far as the likelihood function is concerned, taking the Ys to be conditionally IID Bernoulli theta given theta, but I have to behave like a Frequentist who treats theta as a random variable with what later on we're going to agree, and we've already begun to agree right now, is the prior distribution. But if you look at the form of that integral a few, a few pages ago, it's actually, mathematically, it's not necessarily a prior distribution. It's just a mixing distribution. This says take a weighted average of these Bernoulli sampling distributions weighted by this distribution here. So this is a mixture representation. And De Finetti says the only, the only logically internally consistent predictive distributions have to have this mixture character. And his theorem doesn't say what P of theta is, the mixing distribution is, but we can see, looking at the logic of what's going on, that it has to be the prior distribution. So this is the first example of a general fact that we'll see over and over again. Um, the YIs are exchangeable. We saw that didn't make them independent, because there's information in some Ys for predicting the other ones. But that's equivalent to saying that they become conditionally IID given the values of the parameters in the model. Because if you look at that expression a minute ago, if we knew what theta was, the YIs become conditionally IID Bernoulli with that theta. So we get an IID thing happening under exchangeability, but only it's a kind of conditional IID given the values of the parameters. And that's the way in which the Bayesian idea of exchangeability connects up with the Frequentist idea of independence. Exchangeability is a special kind of conditional independence. Binary exchangeable Ys are not independent, but they become conditionally independent given, given the underlying theta. Uh -huh. Yeah, it just means, um, uh, it turns out when you look at the nature of this sort of thing that this is also going to be turn out to be an unnormalized probability distribution. If you take any probability distribution and you multiply it by another probability distribution, average over it, that's creating a new probability distribution that's a mixture. It's a mixture, it's a, it's a P mixture of these things, is the jargon people would use. And so that's going to be an example of a mixing story. So I think that's been, well, that's a lot for one day, right? So uh, let's stop there. <laughs>